morning. No better place to be than to be gathered together to remember the greatest day in all of history, the day when Christ rose from the grave. And our prayer today is that this would not just be a, a ritual religious gathering or a slick presentation for those watching at home. Our prayer today is that we each meet Jesus and we know something of the risen Christ in our hearts today as we remember his victory and as we celebrate his resurrection and know that he reigns and lives to this day. Our opening hymn makes the declaration that death is dead, love is one, 
and Christ has conquered. Uh, the praise band have been busy the last couple of weeks, and so the first hymn that the guys will uh, lead us in from the back is See What a Morning. Thanks, lads. is dead love is one and christ is conquered we rejoice in the resurrection this morning and i'm going to ask hilary now to come and lead us in prayer together risen indeed. Heavenly Father, today we would like to thank you for Easter Day, for sending your Son Jesus to earth to rescue us, to show us you love us, a love that is so long and high and wide and deep, it is beyond our imagination. Mm -hmm. And we thank you that the grave could not hold Jesus mm -hmm. and he is alive. We thank you today, Heavenly Father, for the reopening of our church and we can meet together again with our church family. We pray for all our church members, and particularly for those who are unwell today and who could not attend church. Bring them comfort and peace today. We pray for our city of Dundee mm -hmm. and all the Christian organizations locally, for Eagle's Wings, for the parish nurses, 
for the street pastors, for Reconnection Project, and in Arbroath, the Windmill Christian Centre, and in Instewer Teen Ranch. We pray that as these restrictions lift, that you will be with them. As they make plans for the months ahead, there is a great need for the services they bring and for telling people about you and how you can change lives. As our country is starting to emerge from lockdown, we think of other countries entering a third wave of the virus and in lockdown once again. And we pray for vaccinations to reach all corners of the globe. We pray that our vaccination programme will be effective in keeping us safe. Today, for those who are hurting, lonely, anxious or worried, we pray that this day they will hear the good news of how you can transform lives and send a peace that passes all understanding. And now I pray that you will open our ears, that we may hear your word for us today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thanks, Hilary. I'm going to turn our attention to the garden tomb now with our first of two readings. And Chimney Davin is going to come up and read from Luke's Gospel. Will it become Chimney? Good morning. Um, I'm reading from Luke 24. This is 1 to 8. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In the frights, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember, he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Thanks, Chinmay. Incredible for us to think of what that reaction would be from those who first heard, the first people to hear of Christ's resurrection. Adam and I were doing our uh, Jesus Storybook Bible last night, thinking of Mary's reaction as she sprinted away to tell the others. Uh, our second hymn is a classic Easter hymn, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. God sent his son and called him Jesus. And hopefully today we can say with true sincerity, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. We do have a, a hope within us through Jesus Christ that cannot be taken from us, that can take on any of life's challenges. As our second hymn, Because He Lives.
to our second passage now and consider Paul's words after the resurrection of Jesus as he writes to the church in Corinth. I'm going to ask Fiona now to come up and read from 1 Corinthians. Good morning. The reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and starting at verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the death comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then moving over to verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Fiona. One of the joys of having uh, two little kids is you get to introduce them to the movies that you watched when you were a kid. And uh, we sometimes do that with our boys to see if they react in the right way. And so, with that in mind, I want to show you a short video about some other kids who were introduced to a movie uh, from my childhood, some of your childhoods as well, some of your middle-aged, because it was uh, only 30 years ago. But this is uh, some kids getting introduced to the movie Beauty and the Beast. Thanks, Kenny. to see you one last time. No, no, please, please, please don't leave me. Is that a good ending? No. no. Very happy. Happy, happy, happy. 
they get married, they become best friends, they make everyone feel happy, they don't feel sad because it's not sad. Uh, it, because it, you can't have a good story without a good ending, otherwise it'll just make it bad. What did it make you feel when you watched the, the second of it? Embarrassed. Was the kiss. How is it like the Easter story? Easter story. Easter story. Easter story. Easter story. Like many stories, Beauty and the Beast is an echo of the true story. And we learn that God, the great storyteller, would not write a story that was to end in death, but end in life. I'll be honest with you, for many years I didn't quite understand Easter. I understood the part that Jesus rose from the dead, I got that bit, but I didn't quite understand Easter in terms of its implications, in terms of what difference it was actually supposed to make to me and to other people. I tended to think Jesus rose from the dead, good for him, but I can't quite see why we're all supposed to celebrate this in a wonderful way. It was good for him, it was wonderful, but I just couldn't quite seem to see why it mattered to us. This seemed to be someone else's good news from my perspective. Like when you hear somebody gets a new job or they're having a baby or they're getting married, you think that, that's good, well, good for them, happy for them. But you know that for most of the time, it's not really going to change you. It's not really going to make too much of a difference to your life. And similarly, I struggle to see why the story of the empty tomb actually made the slightest bit of difference to me. And I wonder if perhaps there are other people in a similar boat even today, even folk in churches like this one, who can recognize and even believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but they have a hard time saying why this really has made a difference to their life. It's a nice event and all, but once we're done with church and rolling our eggs or whatever we're, we're done, we're doing today, how has the resurrection changed anything for us? How has it changed your outlook on life, your worldview, the way that you see things, the way you take on problems and face the big issues in life? How has it changed you as a person? And so today I want to do something I've never done before, which is something called a three-point sermon, okay? I hear they're all the rage. I've never tried it myself, but we'll see how we get on today. And I want to consider three implications to the resurrection, three differences it makes, three facts that really are game changers for us today because the tomb was empty. Three, two, three truths we can consider. And the first truth is this. The enemy doesn't have the last word. The enemy doesn't have the last word. Now, what do we mean by that? When I'm saying the enemy, I'm not referring to the usual enemy that we speak about as Christians. Normally, we speak about Satan as the enemy, and he is the enemy. But the Bible actually speaks of more enemies that we have. And one of those, as we considered in that last reading there in 1 Corinthians, that one of those enemies is death. The person in 1 Corinthians 15 at Funeral read for us said, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Well, forgive me for a moment to get a little bit dark for a second, but we're not really going to be able to embrace this resurrection unless we consider the darkness and the horror of death, something we don't like thinking about. In the Old Testament, there's a book called Ecclesiastes, and it's basically a guy, probably King Solomon, who's at the end of his life, and he's kind of writing his memoirs, his reflections on what life is all about. And trying to find what is the meaning of life? What's, what's the whole point of being alive? And he writes in 2 Corinthians 15, sorry, done that one. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 2, rather, Ecclesiastes 2, verses 14 to 16, he basically comes to the realization that maybe, maybe the point of life is to be wise. Maybe that's what it's about. Maybe the point of living is to not be a fool, but to be wise. And he says these words. He says, and yet I perceived that the same event happens to all of them, meaning both the foolish and the wise. The same event happens to both. And I said in my heart, what happens to the fool is also going to happen to me as well. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity, i.e. meaningless, pointless. For of the wise as of the fool, there's no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. Like the fool, the wise too must die. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So what he's basically saying here is, what does it matter? What does it matter if I, if I live to be wise or I live to be foolish? What does it matter if I live to be rich or, to, or, or live a life of poverty? Or if I'm smart or if I'm dumb? If I spend my life helping people or spend my life harming people? What difference does it make? Both parties still end up in the same place. They both end up in the grave. The same fate overtakes both. This is kind of depressing to consider today. See, this man, probably Solomon, he seems to hate the fact that he can do so much in life. He can earn so much money and achieve so much and have all these grand experiences and then has no one really to pass it on to the next generation. And he may well pass it on to someone who's an idiot. He doesn't get to take his achievements with him. He leaves everything behind at his death. And so it begs for us today this difficult question. How do we face each day in the valley of the shadow of death? Having to deal with this reality that Solomon was considering. The reality that after COVID has come and gone, and this pandemic is a thing of the past, the brutal truth that we'll still be a world full of dying people. We have not cheated death. We have not beaten death. Death still gets the last word. And that's difficult for folk who are in a culture just now that is just trying to say to us, you know, enjoy your best life. Have as much as you can. Live for the greatest experiences. You know, make the most of it. Live for the day. But whatever you do, the culture whispers, whatever you do, don't think about death. And don't think about what happens after death. Never think about that. Why? Because we have no answer to it. This culture has no answer to these questions. We have an answer to everything else. Most of them can be found on Amazon. Click a button and you can get whatever you need, it seems. We've got this vaccine now that seems to overcome this pandemic. But death, the truth that it's coming for all of us, that all that we see and do and experience will one day seem kind of pointless. What do we do with that? See, we can look at Christianity and look at this message of an empty tomb and say, well, that's just, you know, archaic fairy tales and cast it to the side. But let's not pretend that this culture has any kind of better answer to it than what Christianity gives us. The fact is that if your life were a book documenting all the things you say and all the things you think and do and your reflections and your ups and downs, the fact is you would not get to write the last page of that book. The author of the last page would be death. Now, what do we do with that? How do we face that? That's really, really dark, but we need to come to terms with this so that we can embrace what today is all about. That as that video, Beauty and the Beast video just showed us, maybe death's not actually supposed to have the last word. Maybe the God who breathed all things into existence didn't do so in a way that would mean death had the last word. Maybe it's not all supposed to end in that way. Because what today is, Across the world, as you've considered already, it's the declaration, it's the public, global, cosmic announcement that we have a champion for whom Acts chapter 2 says it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Romans 6, 9 says that death no longer has dominion or mastery over Jesus. Death that seems to have the last word on every life, it is not the boss of Jesus Christ. 
He even handed himself over to death to show us that he would defeat it and in doing so would pay the price for the sin that has pulled us away from the God of life in the first place. So Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 15 with good reason, as we've just heard, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Death loses the last word in Jesus Christ. When you have an argument with somebody, and you usually do probably, whoever gets the last word is usually the winner. The the resurrection of Jesus shows that he has the last word. And that is significant because of point number two, which is that his resurrection means our resurrection. Again, we just saw it on the screen. John says, in, uh, Jesus says in John's Gospel, chapter 14, he says, because I live, you also will live. And when we read that passage in 1 Corinthians, we see that this is not just good news for Jesus. It's not just a celebration for the man who, ra- who rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. But what we see is that his victory over death is shared. It's shared with those who are united to him by faith. This is the good news of the gospel, that what we see in the cross and the empty tomb is not just historical events, though it is that. It's not just theological facts or truths about God, though it is that as well. But what we see in the cross and the empty tomb is an invitation. And it's an invitation for sinners. For those who are willing to admit defeat in the battle with their own brokenness and their own sin. And those who know that they will lose the battle with death. It's an invitation for those who are guilty, ashamed, broken, rebellious, inadequate, fearful, anxious, hopeless. Do any of those words describe you in any way? Many of them can describe me very often. The cross and the empty tomb is God's way of saying, come. Come, let go of your other sources of hope. Your other methods of coping, they're not working. Come to Jesus. See his victory and see what he has done. And turn from the old life and embrace him. And embrace the forgiveness that he offers. Share in his victory. Share in the reality that death will not have the last word for you. Because when we come to him, we are in him and he is in us. And there is no separating the two. Not even death itself will separate the two. You'll be familiar with the famous old quote often attributed to Billy Graham. It may have been D.L. Moody, not too sure, but we'll go with Billy Graham for this. When he said, someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? I shall be more alive then than I am now. But not only will we be alive forevermore but we are alive with him the message of the resurrection is not just that you get to live forever which doesn't sound all that exciting for some people if their life is quite difficult and hard but you live with him because Christ lives we know the light of his presence all the time the rescuer does not rescue us so that we'll go back to normal and live same sinful lives he rescues us so that we belong to him he's the father who wraps his arms around us but not only will be not only will we be alive with him then in eternity but we're alive with him now today in a relationship with jesus and what that does is that reverses the problem we saw a minute ago in Ecclesiastes with Solomon because he felt life was pointless because death has the last word. But for those who are in Christ, death is conquered and therefore life has purpose. Life has color. Every day is a day following Jesus, seeing what he has in store for us, showing his love and carrying his gospel to a dying, broken world and living in fellowship with those who have also been rescued, who have come to him by faith. The resurrection brings life to the church of Jesus Christ. So the enemy doesn't have the last word. His resurrection is our resurrection. And lastly, point three is everything sad will become untrue. The last implication of the resurrection we'll consider this morning. Everything sad will become untrue. It has taken an incredible amount of self-control on my part today, not to quote the Chronicles of Narnia to you. 
I'm, I may still do it. We're not even sure what's going to happen or not. But rather than go to Narnia, let me take you somewhere else. Let me take you to Middle Earth. Which is pretty much the same. Lord of the Rings, when at the very end in this great cosmic battle is won, spoiler alert, it's been up for 70 years, you should have read it by now, but anyway, when the, the great cosmic battle is won, evil is defeated, and little Sam the Hobbit turns to Gandalf the wizard, Sam thought Gandalf was dead by the way, in disbelief, and he says to Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. And then he asked the question, is everything sad going to become untrue? Is everything sad going to become untrue? We saw in the video, the Beauty and the Beast one, the happily ever after, when all the brokenness and the ugliness just comes to life at the end. Is that going to happen? Because we know the sufferings of this life are many, for some more than others. And we know that Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. And he wasn't joking, was he? This broken world we live in, it's hard. We think of Christians just now who are not in a building like this, who are in a prison somewhere or in a freezer against their will in North Korea, who love Jesus, but they can't gather like this. They're being persecuted. They know they may well be beheaded. Where's the hope for them in this? Is there hope that everything sad will become untrue? In light of the brokenness of this world and the suffering we see, we are left with this longing within us that one day darkness will pass once and for all. You don't need to be a Christian to have this longing. Everybody hopes that this darkness will pass once and for all, that the sufferings of this world will come to an end, that there is a reason to be hopeful and not just filled with dread, not just see life as something you suffer through for a while, then you die. Is that all life is? Or is there a reason to be hopeful? Tim Keller says, the answer of Christianity to that question, is everything sad going to become untrue? The answer to that question is yes. Everything sad will and is going to come untrue. And it will somehow be greater for having once been lost and broken. The resurrection of Jesus Christ shows us that the horrors of the cross were not meaningless. And that our suffering, whatever that may be, and the suffering of those across the world following Christ, that suffering is also not pointless. Because there is a day coming when all tears will be wiped away. And Jesus will wipe every tear from our eyes. And that for those in Christ, there is the hope, there is the certainty that the best is yet to come. That justice will prevail, that evil will die, that our failures will not define us, that death will not have the last word as we've already thought. But none of this would be true if the corpse of the Nazarene carpenter had remained a corpse if he'd remained behind that stone, we would be hopeless. We'd be left trying to come up with some way to deal with our impending death. We'd have no answer to the sufferings of this life. But Jesus rose. And so we can say, yes, death is defeated. And Jesus is with me. And Jesus will raise me. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. It makes the greatest difference. It changes everything. It changes the way we face the world. And I pray today that it makes the greatest difference to you. Whatever you're facing this week or this year, I pray that the fact that Jesus Christ is alive is something that has changed you from the inside out because our response to him is that we give him the honor and the worship and the glory that he is due as our king, our conquering champion who defeated death. Our our, uh, closing hymn is a hymn called Anastasis, which is a Greek word which translates to resurrection. And it is a hymn of praise to the one who conquered the grave. And the chorus says, Praise the name of the Lord our God. Praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, O Lord our God. We'll have this final hymn and then we'll close in prayer. my mind to Calvary where
Lord Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tent. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the seeds, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. So I said to be a cause. Can we stand together, cause and prayer? Is that okay? We rise together. Let's, uh, let's come before our Father. Father, we thank you. And we praise you. We praise your name forevermore. For endless days, we will sing your praise because Christ has conquered death and lives and reigns this day. We can sing, O oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. And we join with them, Father. We recognize Jesus is our champion and we pray, Father, that this resurrection will change us from the inside out as we seek to honor and glorify you. Be with us, we pray, and help us to enjoy and embrace the glory of Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our service is over. The lads will play us up with the, uh, some music. But thanks so much for joining with us today and we hope you have a great Easter, whatever you're doing. God bless you.